Hello, this is Michael Altos. We're back with our cardiovascular system uh, second lecture talking about antiarrhythmics and calcium channel blockers. And this is part two of the recording. The next drug I want to talk about is adenosine. Some people get adenosine and amiodarone confused when they're first learning about them, but they are very, very different drugs. Adenosine is actually a substance that's found endogenously in your body. It's a nucleoside. Um, its effect in the physiology is that it's a coronary dilator and it decreases myocardial oxygen consumption. So that's a good thing. It's a very, very short acting drug. Its half time is just about a second and then it's gone. What do we use adenosine for? Well, when we administer adenosine, it stimulates uh, potassium channels and causes hyperpolarization um, and decreased depolarization. So basically, it stops the heart from having electrical activity. Uh, and this all happens in the supraventricular uh, portion of the heart. So what do we use adenosine for? It's mostly used to identify and treat AV nodal supraventricular tachycardias, so re-entrant tachycardias, atrial tachycardias, um, the physiology of which we're not going to get into today, although it's very interesting. Um, but basically, if a patient has classic SVT, if they have the AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia, we can treat it with adenosine. You give 6 milligram rapid IV bolus, and it's supposed to be rapid because we said its half-life is only a second, and you need it to get from the arm all the way up to the heart before it's metabolized. If patients need a second dose, you can give them 12 milligrams. Sometimes that dose needs to be repeated. What happens? The patients get a transient heart block, brief ventricular asystole. And here's an example of a patient who got adenosine. So they're in this uh, rapid heart rate of um, above 150. And then they got adenosine, threw off a couple PVCs, and then the heart stopped. One escape beat, and then the heart stopped again. And when their heart stops, sometimes your heart wants to stop too because it's pretty exciting to see your patient have a flat line on the EKG. Uh, but asystole will do that, um, and they almost always come back. And that's adenosine. Probably a good idea to have some uh, artificial pacing patches available just in case, have some atropine available. Uh, but in general, that's what adenosine does. Now, it's not a good treatment for atrial fibrillation or flutter. It doesn't convert people out of those rhythms but it's good for these re-entrant tachycardias like SVT. And if patients already have a bad heart, like heart block or sick sinus syndrome, I would definitely have a pacemaker available. Um, this is not a drug you want to be giving without appropriate backup. Side effects of adenosine include flushing, uh, dyspnea. People can say they have chest pain or bronchospasm or a funny metallic taste in their mouth. And it makes people pretty upset when they feel their heart stop beating for a few seconds. So. In the awake patient, they'll need some reassurance, if not a little bit of light sedation, if when it's appropriate. <clears throat> Adenosine has some other interesting uses. So it can be used as an infusion for controlled hypotension. I've never done that, but that might be seen in like a cardiac procedure room. Sometimes surgeons will request asystole for a few seconds if they're trying to clip an aneurysm, like especially in the brain, or they're deploying an endovascular heart valve, they may ask for adenosine to temporarily stop the heart. And then, of course, because it's a nice vasodilator, it's good for pharmacologic stress testing, where it can cause that coronary steel syndrome we discussed in the previous lecture. So take a moment. If you have any questions about adenosine, please let me know, and I can clarify them for you. Now we're going to move on to calcium channel blockers, a whole different category of medications. Calcium channel blockers bind to certain specific types of calcium channels which are located in your cardiac and vascular smooth muscle. And when that happens, you have a decreased level of intracellular calcium. And this makes four specific things happen. Um, in the heart, it decreases myocardial contractility. So they're kind of bad for the heart in that sense. They decrease heart rate. So that could be good for the heart. Not only do they decrease heart rate, but they decrease activity in the nodes, in the SA node and maybe the AV node conduction as well. So another negative effect on heart rate, which could be good. And finally, in the vascular smooth muscle, they cause relaxation, which would cause um, vasodilation and maybe a decrease in blood pressure. Now, as a result, the two kinds of patients who really shouldn't get calcium channel blockers without some careful thought first are patients who have heart disease like left ventricular 
function compromise, and patients who are hypovolemic because they'll become very hypotensive. That's not to say they can't have these drugs, but you should be aware that caution should be used before you give these drugs to those patients. Now, calcium channel blockers as a class are very highly protein-bound, and they're all uh, metabolized in the liver. Because they mess with the calcium channels, you could guess that they um, mess with neuromuscular blockade as well, and it actually makes the neuromuscular blocking drugs a little bit more potent. Calcium channel blockers are available in a number of different uh, forms. When we give them IV, you can give them as a bolus or as an infusion or both. And finally, again, because they act on uh, ion channels, they can potentiate local anesthetic activity and maybe increase risk of local anesthetic toxicity at high doses. So let's talk about some specific calcium channel blockers. And the first, th there are sort of two classes in my mind of calcium channel blockers. There are the ones that we use for heart rate and the ones that we use for blood pressure. And we'll come back to that distinction in a few slides. First, let's talk about the heart rate drugs. And the most common is diltiazem, brand name is cardizem. It is a benzothiazepine, but you don't have to know that. This is what I would consider your first line medication for supraventricular tachydysrhythmias um, in the calcium channel blockers. So you might be treating tachycardia with uh, a beta blocker, you might treat it with digoxin, a lot of things you can use, but if you're going to pick a calcium channel blocker, this is the one. It blocks your AV node calcium channels, and I put some dosing information for you. Usually the bolus is about 0.25 milligrams per kilogram IV given over two minutes. 20 milligrams is a pretty typical dose of diltiazem if you're trying to dilt load a patient. If you need to repeat the dose, usually it's a higher dose given about uh, 2 to 15 minutes after the first dose. And you can also run someone on a cardizem drip, usually at 5 to 15 milligrams per hour. Now, calcium channel blockers like diltiazem will lower blood pressure, and they can be used to cause arterial vasodilation and treat chronic hypertension. But that's not really their primary goal. And there are, as we'll see, there are other calcium channel blockers that are more uh, specialized towards this goal. Now, diltiazem's side effects are mostly what you would expect the dizziness and the headaches and the flushing, the gingival hyperplasia, overgrowth of the gums is something you see on a long-term basis, not um, in front of your eyes in the operating room. This is a drug you might want to avoid in patients who already have uh, coronary disease or hypotension or severe conduction problems in their heart. It's available in a lot of different forms. Orally, it can be taken immediate release, sustained release, extended release. Patients may take it for angina, for hypertension, uh, for rate control of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And then, of course, we can give it IV to treat, usually for treating um, tachydysrhythmias like AFib or A-flutter with a rapid ventricular rate. The other uh, heart rate-oriented uh, calcium channel blocker is verapamil, uh, which is a different class. It's a phenylalkylamine. Again, you don't need to know that. Again, it's used for treatment of supraventricular tachydysrhythmias. It may be used to treat angina as well and hypertension. And we're not going to get into this in a lot of detail. It's pretty much similar to diltiazem. And odds are, if you're giving a calcium channel blocker for uh, AFib with RVR, you're probably going to give diltiazem. Uh, if you see patients taking this drug at home, they might be taking it for angina. They might be taking it for hypertension. They also might be taking it for migraines or cluster headaches. Calcium channel blockers seem to be effective in a subset of migraine sufferers. So those are the two heart rate specific calcium channel blockers. Now let's talk about the uh, vasculature specific calcium channel blockers, the ones that really treat um, hypertension and things like that. Uh, these are called dihydropyridinines. Again, you don't need to know that. Uh, specific drugs include nifedipine, nimodipine, nicardipine, and let's talk about each of those for just a minute. Nifedipine, also called procardia, and people might take this to treat angina, again, uh, because it is a vasodilator. And especially patients who have angina, not because of coronary vascular disease, but because of coronary vasospasm. Uh, but it does vasodilate both your coronary and your peripheral arteries. Nimodipine is similar. Nimodipine, nimodipine is interesting because it's lipid soluble, which means it can cross the blood brain barrier. So, this is a good drug for patients at risk of cerebral vasospasm. For instance, patients who have had an intracranial hemorrhage and are being observed in the hospital for a couple weeks to prevent cerebral vasospasm. That's nimodipine. 
Nicardipine, also known as cardine, for many years was kind of our mainstay calcium channel blocker to control hypertension. It doesn't really have any effects on the SA or AV node, and it's just used to treat either angina or else hypertension. Again, coronary and peripheral artery vasodilation. And you run an IV infusion, you start it at 5 milligrams an hour, and you can titrate up or down every, 15, every 5 minutes um, in order to get where you need to be. Um, nicardipine is also tocolytic, which means it uh, inhibits labor, so it might be used in the treatment of premature labor. Uh, the problem with nicardipine is it's a little bit of a slow-on, slow-off drug. It's not as fast as we anesthesia and critical care people might like to have. And so about five years ago, clavidipine became widely available, also known as clevaprex. It's in a lipid emulsion. It looks exactly like propofol. So if you ever thought that you didn't have to label your propofol syringe, because what else could possibly look like that? Well, clavidipine looks exactly like it. Now, clavidipine is metabolized by plasma and tissue esterases, not pseudocolonesterase, but some of the other esterases. And so the drug is actually gone in a minute. And usually people will just run an infusion, one or two milligrams per hour, all the way up to 16 milligrams an hour, and just titrate it to blood pressure. I do see people using it as a, as a bolus, primarily in the heart room or some of the other major vascular cases. And they're giving a fraction of a cc because this drug is very, very potent. So that's clavidipine or clevaprex. One drug that you are undoubtedly familiar with is amlodipine, also known as Norvasc, and this is an oral medication, and it's really a lot like nicardipine or nifedipine, and patients take this all the time for management of their hypertension. So this is a drug you'll see many of our patients uh, telling you that they take every day at home, and it's just another calcium channel blocker. This is a chart that I made for myself to help sort out some of these drugs, and this just summarizes the drugs in very broad, non-specific terms. So when I think about my uh, heart rate type calcium channel blockers versus my blood pressure type calcium channel blockers, and then see how do they affect blood pressure, heart rate, and some of these other uh, specific things. And so we can see right off the bat that all of these drugs are gonna drop your blood pressure. Uh, some of them are more blood pressure specific, but they all can have the potential to cause hypotension. The difference is that the diltiazem may drop your heart rate, while these other drugs don't have any effect on heart rate, and you may, may see actually some reflex tachycardia. Um, and so on with this chart, which just gives you a little bit of an overview of the effect of the calcium channel blockers. That's it for this lecture. Please get in touch with me if you have any questions or need anything clarified, and we'll look forward to seeing you in class.